No, it just not, a little bit in response to the question. I, she may have walked out of the the room. I mean, what Frank was saying, we now have a system of 360 degree ubiquitous data collection as the basic business model all over the world. And to use that information, um, and to, which means increased power and influence over especially the most powerful corporate and, and special interests. But it's, much of it is focused on getting us to buy and spend. This is kind of just a prelog pre to your prologue to your panel. Much of it is to getting us to <laughs> direct our activities at the, at the grocery store, at the retail store, what financial products, what loans. Uh, this is the essence of this system, to, to a ubiquitous human interface run, but also an autonomous system to get us to buy and spend at all times without any constraint and restraint. Now, it's also being used in the political sector, which is not the pur purpose of, of this panel. Um, but now we've heard about the scope and power and the impact of the black box big data world. What have regulators been thinking about? What have they been doing? What can they do? And we'll have Frank respond after you present. So we're very pleased to have two leading uh, uh, officials in, in the consumer protection field, Jessica Rich, Director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection of the Federal Trade Commission, Peggy Tui, the Assistant Director, Office of Supervision, Supervision Policy at the CFPB. Uh, Both have a distinguished career working to protect consumers, addressing a broad range of concerns, including financial services. We'll start with Jessica. Okay, is this on? Okay, uh, well, thanks so much for inviting me here today uh, to uh, discuss the important topic of big data and its effects on consumers today. Um, I'm especially pleased to be sharing the panel here with Frank and with Peggy, who um, I was, uh, she and I were very close colleagues for years at the FTC, and now she's my very favorite person at the CFPB. Um, <laughs> I can safely say that. Um, so um, big data is a term we are uh, hearing a lot lately, lately and it can mean uh, many different things to many different people, depending on the context. Um, uh, it's become such an integral part of our lexicon that um, uh, it's even the name of a popular alternative rock band. I have a 17-year-old, so I listen to those stations, uh, which has a current hit called Dangerous. That's the name of it. Um, so when most of us in this room uh, refer to big data, we're generally talking about the confluence of three factors, uh, which uh, together have a profound effect on consumers. First is the ubiquitous collection of, um, of consumer data through the internet, through social media, through mobile devices and sensors, Google and Facebook, your mobile phone, your fitness tracker, your new smart car, uh, retail tracking, it's really everywhere you go. Um, second is the plummeting cost of storing data, uh, which has enabled and, and encouraged um, ever more collection and use of, of, of consumer data, much of it sensitive. Uh, and third is the powerful new capability to analyze data, to draw connections and make inferences and predictions. Uh, in other words, we're talking about the three Vs, and some people say there's like six Vs, but I'm up to three, volume, velocity, and variety, um, each of which is pro proliferating at a rapid rate and which together allow for the analysis and use of data in ways that weren't previously possible. Um, as we know, big data is increasingly being used to make decisions about a wide range of issues affecting consumers. Uh, the FTC held a workshop on this issue uh, last fall entitled Big Data, a Tool for Inclusion or Exclusion, and the title kind of says it all, uh, to discuss both the consumer benefits of, and harms of this phenomenon, focusing in particular on low-income and underserved consumers. Uh, certainly there are benefits. Uh, for example, big data is being used to develop alternative credit scores for consumers who don't have traditional uh, credit histories and were previously, previously considered unscorable and, um, and thus ineligible for credit. Uh, big data can also increase access to education, for example, by identifying students uh, for advanced classes who uh, otherwise wouldn't have been chosen based on the usual criteria, or alternatively, uh, students at risk of dropping out and who need help. Um, big data also offers health and safety benefits. Uh, it can be used to predict life expectancy, 
genetic predisposition to disease and likelihood of hospital readmission, uh, allowing healthcare providers to develop more effective treatment plans uh, and lower healthcare costs. Or, um, uh, I don't know if everyone saw the Washington Post article yesterday, which is totally on this topic, fascinating. Uh, they mentioned, you know, about wearables, they mentioned it could be used to find cancer clusters or contaminated waterways. There's a lot of good examples in here. Um, but each of these benefits has a flip side, of course. Um, just as big data can be used to uh, extend credit, educational opportunity, and health benefits to consumers, uh, so too can it be used to deny those services. For example, there are now scores for everything from consumer profitability scores, which predict households that are likely to be profitable and, and pay debts, to fraud scores that predict uh, whether a consumer is masquerading as another or engaging some, in some other mischief. Um, these scores can be used to deny consumers the ability to complete transactions without any explanation. Uh, further, if online uh, companies uh, charge consumers in different zip codes, different prices, one result could be that consumers in poorer neighborhoods uh, pay more for online products than consumers in affluent communities. And in the FTC's fraud, fraud program, we are seeing consumers targeted again and again by scam artists uh, using detailed c consumer data bought from other companies that includes bank account numbers, social security numbers, and lending histories. Uh, with the growing popularity of wearable health devices, of course, the effects of big data may be particularly dramatic when it comes to the collection and use of consumers' sensitive health data. Um, according to, to this article, and um, there were a lot of interesting surveys they cited, and I'm going to go look them all up uh, when I get back to my office. Uh, surveys show that an estimated 68 million wearable devices will be shipped this year, uh, and that many consumers share information collected through these devices with somebody else. Uh, these are the challenges that con these are among the challenges that uh, the privacy and uh, and other challenges that consumers face today, uh, and they are considerable. Um, but the the FTC does have an active uh, program uh, to address these issues. Um, first, we're doing what we can to open the black box and shine a light on big data practices. Uh, last year, we issued a report on our in-depth study of nine data brokers representing a cross section of the industry. Uh, the report discussed how uh, data brokers acquire and store billions of data elements on, um, on uh, nearly every U.S. consumer and develop de detailed profiles for sale to other companies. Uh, it also discussed how data brokers don't just collect and share raw data, uh, but also develop inferences about people and put them into uh, enduring categories, such as urban scramble and mobile mixers, which characterize low-income minority, minority consumers, thrifty elders, and financially challenged. Um, virtually all of this happens behind the scenes uh, without consumers having any idea, let alone control over it. Uh, the report called on Congress to pass legislation requiring greatest, greater transparency, including by giving uh, consumers access to their data and choices about how it will be used. Uh, notably, the report also called on consumer-facing entities, such as retailers, to provide choices to consumers before sharing data with data brokers. I think that's an important piece of this. Um, also, as I mentioned, we held our big data uh, workshop last fall to examine the other side of the transaction, which is whether and how the use of big data is benefiting uh, consumers or excluding them from full opportunities in the marketplace. Uh, we intend to release a report on that workshop later this year. Um, second, uh, the FTC is enforcing the laws currently on the books that address uses of big data that harm consumers. One of the big messages we want to send to businesses and the public is that there are indeed laws, current laws that apply here, uh, and they need to be followed. These include the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which uh, was just discussed, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which I believe was also discussed, and the FTC Act's, uh, uh, ban, uh, FTC Act's ban on unfair or deceptive practices. Um, the FCRA is a particularly valuable tool in this area, and I'm sure Peggy will discuss that in greater detail, because it contains requirements for ensuring the accuracy uh, and privacy of data used to make important decisions, credit, employment, insurance, and other uh, important decisions about consumers. Enforcing this law has been and continues to be an, a priority at the FTC. To date, we've brought over 100 um, uh, FCRA cases, and we've obtained uh, 30 million in civil penalties. It's one of those 
uh, laws where we can obtain civil penalties for privacy. Uh, and we're increasingly bringing cases against non-traditional consumer reporting agencies. Um, Ed mentioned this. Often data brokers that sell data for FCRA covered activities without complying with the law. Uh, for example, we recently entered into consent decrees with InfoTrack and Instant Checkmate, data brokers that sell detailed background checks to employers and landlords for use in deciding whether to um, provide consumers with job and jobs and housing. Our complaints allege that these companies failed to ensure that the data was accurate or that the purchaser had a permissible purpose to buy it as required by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, the orders include civil penalty judgments of $1 million for uh, InfoTrack and uh, over $500,000 for Instant Checkmate. Similarly, our cases uh, last year against Telecheck and Surtigy involved data brokers that sold consumer data to companies deciding whether to accept checks from consumers in stores. Uh, as you know, consumers that write checks in stores are often elderly, um, illustrating the importance of the FCRA, FCRA for protecting certain uh, consumer groups. Uh, the companies each paid three and a half million um, penalties uh, for those cases. Um, even those companies that um, purport to comply with the law need watching. Um, a few years ago, we brought a case alleging that Equifax sold pre-screened lists of consumers who were late on their mortgage payments, uh, these are credit reports, um, uh, to another company that then sold this information uh, to companies that used it to pitch fraudulent debt relief services to consumers in financial distress. Similarly, we took action against a company called Teletrack, a consumer reported uh, agency serving the subprime marketplace uh, for selling its consumer report inf uh, information uh, directly to marketers, including lists of consumers who had applied for payday loans. Uh, we now know that these types of lists are a big source of the phantom debt fraud uh, that we are seeing throughout the marketplace, and it's a growing problem. Uh, the FCRA also covers those who purchase and use consumer report information. Uh, if a company buys this information from a consumer reporting agency and uses it to make decisions about consumers' employment, credit, insurance, or housing, and, and certain other benefits, uh, the FCRA applies. Uh, this means that companies must, among other things, provide consumers with adverse action notices. You would mention those that weren't provided uh, uh, if they decide to deny those benefits to consumers. Uh, similarly, companies um, also must now provide risk-based pricing notices if they use consumer reports uh, to provide credit to consumers on less favorable terms than other consumers. Uh, last year, for example, we brought an action against uh, Time Warner Cable. Uh, and attained, uh, obtained almost $2 million in penalties uh, because the company used credit reports to decide whether to require consumers to pay a deposit on their cable bill, but failed to provide these consumers with risk-based pricing notices. Uh, in addition to the um, FCRA, there's also the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the FTC Act. Uh, the ECOA pr prohibits discrimination in credit based on protected characteristics such as race, color, uh, gender, and age. Uh, so if a company makes credit decisions about individuals based on big data, it could violate uh, the ECOA if the decision leads to disparate treatment or disparate impact on those individuals. Uh, this is very complex, and you're right, it's being reviewed by the Supreme Court, disparate um, impact. And there's a lot more to the analysis, and Peggy could do a much better job with the ECOA than I could. Uh, but I wanted to highlight the applicability of this law uh, to the black box. Um, and of course, the FTC um, Act, which is our um, core statute, is a highly valuable law here. It prohibits unfair, deceptive practices across most of commerce, uh, and the FTC has used it in many contexts to protect consumers at financial risk. Um, one key area of concern uh, that I'm, I really care about is the increasing ability of scam artists to purchase detailed information about consumers and use it to perpetrate fraud. Um, for example, as I mentioned, we've seen uh, a lot of these phantom debt schemes uh, in recent years in which companies contact consumers who may have applied for a payday loan in the past or even just visited a payday loan site uh, and demanded payments of, uh, of debts that didn't exist or uh, aren't owed to that company, may have been paid off. Typically, these consumers already face financial challenges as evidenced by uh, their interest in payday loans. Uh, and uh, one of my goals this year is to step up our targeting of the companies that sell this data, that are the source of this data for scam artists. 
Um, a recent case against data broker Leap Lab is one example, and we're still in litigation with this company. It's similar to the Equifax and Teletrack cases, but alleges more broadly that the sale of data to scam artists could violate the FTC Act. Our complaint alleged that Leap Lab bought the payday loan applications of financially strapped consumers, which included their bank account information and social security numbers, uh, and the fact that they had applied for um, payday loans, and then sold them to companies whom it knew had no legitimate le need for it. Uh, these buyers included phony internet merchants that used the information to withdraw millions of dollars from consumers' accounts. Um, we charged that Leap Lab's sale of this data to scam artists and others with no legitimate need for it is an unfair practice under the FTC Act. Uh, there's much more to discuss on this topic, obviously, and I, I'm sure I've taken more than my time already. Uh, and I hope we'll be able to expand on the issues um, as Frank asks us questions and tries to stump us. Um, um, but just to plant some seeds, um, you know, I'm well aware that the laws I mentioned have significant gaps, um, and they're far from a perfect fit for today's marketplace. Uh, notably, um, and most people think wearables and health devices are covered by HIPAA, but they're not. Um, they are, however, covered by the FTC Act, generally. Um, and as to the FT FCRA, it's not always clear where marketing ends and eligibility determinations begin. Uh, and the law doesn't apply to businesses that use their own in-house data uh, and analytics to make decisions about their customers or employees. Uh, and also, it could be particularly challenging uh, to address biases that are introduced in the research that forms the basis of the big data that everyone is using. Um, uh, in addition, the S ECOA is limited to credit decisions, so it's a good law, but it's limited. Um, however, I think we can make some real progress by educating businesses and the public about the, ex what the existing laws do require. I do think that's low-hanging fruit in that there seems to be a lack of awareness of that, um, just to use your term. Um, and uh, it, in, in, there's huge benefit to enforcing these laws vigorously and also raising public, just generally raising public awareness about what's in the black box. At the FTC, we intend to uh, do these things um, and push forward on these things using all the tools um, at our disposal. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Peggy? Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting uh, the new kid on the block, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, to join uh, in this panel. Um, as Jessica mentioned, she and I worked together closely for many years at the uh, Federal Trade Commission. Um, so it's great to have Jessica take the lead um, in this panel. Uh, when I was at the FTC, I, I was fairly involved with the uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act uh, work at the FTC, as Ed knows. Um, and, and the ECOA. And the ECOA, yeah. right? And um, one of the comments earlier about um, some consumers thinking uh, credit bureaus were actually part of the government reminded me of at one point in time I was out on the international speaking circuit um, talking about our Fair Credit Reporting Act, our credit reporting regulation um, to those in developing countries um, who were just getting their credit economy going and just trying to figure out how to regulate uh, some of their new, uh, new information gathering that they were doing. Um, and it, I was in Beijing at a conference, and it was the second day before we realized that um, the Chinese in the audience, the Chinese government officials, thought that the um, lobbyist for the credit bureaus, who was there representing CDIA, thought that uh, we worked together, um, the Federal Trade Commission and CDIA. <laughs> we had to explain, no, 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 they were uh, the private sector in the United States. Um, so um, let me talk a little bit about, as um, the new kid on the block, um, the, the role of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We are just getting going as a federal agency. We um, are uh, just a couple years old and just starting to um, use our tools. But I can tell you already that um, consumer reporting um, and uh, the authorities we do have to look at the collection and use of data are already um, among the top priorities of the Bureau, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So what are the tools we have at the CFPB? Well, we do have a compliance role, um, the compliance through both supervision and enforcement, and I'll talk about a little bit about the difference between those. Um, and that is primarily through the Fair Credit Reporting Act, 
or the ECOA. Uh, and in addition, we have um, unfair and deceptive acts and practices authority, as well as abusive authority under our um, organic statute, uh, Title 10 of the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, so we have a compliance role. We also have a research role. Um, and I'll talk about some of the um, studies and um, uh, data points, we call them, that have been issued to date. Um, in addition, we have um, a role for consumer education and awareness. And I agree with Jessica that I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, there and um, uh, a lot of educating um, about all kinds of things in this area that could benefit consumers. Um, we have rule writing and regulatory um, uh, authorities. Um, but we also have um, the ability to, based on what we see, um, use the bully pulpit to just encourage developments and better practices. Um, one example of that was um, Director Cordray, this was a priority for him, to call on the top credit card companies to actually make credit scores more available to consumers, the credit scores they were getting and pulling, <coughs> to make those on a voluntary basis available. And we've seen um, some good progress there. So let me go back to our role in compliance. Um, and um, with respect to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, obviously uh, this group's already talked a lot about how consumer reporting systems are, um, are a major source um, that impacts consumers' lives in all kinds of ways. And it's already been touched on the basic principles established by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, so I won't talk about that. but do just want to note that um, it's interesting to me sometimes when I think about um, how old the Fair Credit Reporting Act is. It was enacted, I believe, in 1970. Um, and it's basically the way the FCRA works is um, say what you will about the disadvantages of the FCRA or things that could use improvement. Um, it does, it is flexible in that it applies to whatever information is used or expected to be used about consumers. So what that means is as there's non-traditional or other data sources coming in to, um, to data systems that are being used in this way that impact consumers and credit, employment, insurance, and other, other decisions being made about them in the marketplace, the FCRA attaches. And so um, all the rights and obligations of the FCRA then therefore cover that, that data source. And so um, thinking about, you know, sort of who, uh, Frank might know, who, who was the uh, author of that in terms of, of the principles that were established, it, um, it, it has served us somewhat well over the years in terms of that flexibility. Um, so I just wanted to, to note that because I think that's um, significant. Um, and that is not the case, as I learned on my international trips, for some of the uh, other countries that have, um, do have public registries. They actually have government, sometimes it'd be the equivalent of the Federal Reserve, um, actually running their credit bureaus. And they have very prescriptive and rigid um, in information coming in that's allowed to come in and be used. Um, and so as we think about these issues, I just want to put that out there as, as sort of um, a, a different way that some countries are approaching this. Um, for consideration in terms of, you know, if we think about the disadvantages of our market approach, our, the marketplace determines what information is used and the FCRA attaches, um, I, at least I for one, would think there could be disadvantages um, from a different approach as well. Um, but back to the CFPB and uh, what, we, what we do with this uh, compliance um, obligation that we have. So as I mentioned, we have um, supervisory and enforcement authority over, uh, we have supervisory authority over the largest consumer reporting agency participants in the marketplace. We had to define those by rule. Um, we have um, jurisdiction over many bank and non-bank furnishers to the consumer reporting agency systems. And we have enforcement authority to ensure compliance um, with the FCRA. And um, as I said, um, supervision of the consumer reporting marketplace has been a priority uh, from the beginning of the, the Bureau's life, the very first larger participant rule that we uh, promulgated um, was to um, establish supervisory authority over consumer reporting agencies. And let me say just a little bit about what that means. So unlike enforcement, where it's um, sending subpoenas 
often uh, difficult, not always Jessica, but sometimes difficult to get information um, and more uh, adversarial in its nature. Supervision is a process where examination teams um, can ask for information from the entity, uh, usually in, in fairly, when you have a cooperative entity, uh, in fairly short order, get that information, send in examination teams to, in real time, look at information, ask questions of the officials, and um, study the practices and make evaluations about whether uh, they're, they're in compliance. Um, this is the kind of authority that has been used for uh, banks for decades and decades. Um, and not just for, to look at their safety and soundness, which is uh, for obvious reasons, we need that kind of tool to make sure the banks are safe and sound, but also for their compliance obligations. Um, so that had been going on in the banking industry for years and years and years, and if you think about it though, this extremely large and impactful industry had grown up, um, the consumer reporting industry, that has such an impact on consumers with no agency until the CFPB being able to use this type of tool, supervision, to go in and um, look behind the curtain again in a more, um, in a more uh, real time basis um, and understand the full extent of the practices and, um, and ensure better compliance through this tool, uh, which can lead to enforcement, but, but not always. Um, and so we established that authority to do that supervisory work, but at the same time, we have um, authority over the largest banks in the country, their affiliates and service providers, as well as many, many non-bank entities that feed into the system. So the mortgage servicers, right now the bank um, auto servicers, soon to be expanded to the non-bank auto servicers, um, student loan servicers, um, debt collectors. So all, to the extent that it's one ecosystem or uh, that, that it matters that all players in the system are um, contributing and complying with the law in terms of accurate information and investigating disputes. Um, one advantage we have in terms of our jurisdictional reach is to look at many parts of it, and indeed we have done that. Um, we issue a report called Supervisory Highlights, um, which um, I think is also precedent setting in that even though supervision is behind the scenes, non-public, unless there's an enforcement action that results from the supervisory work, um, we issue every few months or so um, a report where we report out on what we found in our supervisory work. And one of, the, um, one of the reports we've issued talked about how we found deficiencies in the compliance management systems of consumer reporting agencies. Well, what does that mean? We expect um, all our supervised entities to have in place systems, compliance management systems, so that they make sure they're complying with the law. We expect them to have sufficient board and management oversight. We expect them to have a compliance monitoring program with training, with complaint monitoring, um, with monitoring um, their own compliance activities and self-correcting wherever they find problems, as well as um, an audit function that they go in and, and look um, at their, at, and test for themselves. Um, so it's uh, very important to us that all the entities that we supervise have a strong compliance management system. And we've reported out that we did not find that in some of the consumer reporting agencies that we've looked at so far. Um, so we've directed them to take a number of measures to, um, to improve their compliance management system. We also found that they didn't have adequate oversight of their third party service providers. Um, we found that one or more consumer reporting agencies didn't monitor or track consumer complaints sufficiently, um, and we directed them to um, establish a comprehensive complaint management system. So that's one area that we've looked at. Um, accuracy has been a key focus for us um, in our work. Um, that's the accuracy of the information received by the consumer reporting agencies from lenders, um, how the consumer reporting uh, companies assemble and maintain that information on their own, and the processes that govern um, error resolution when consumers identify or dispute uh, inaccuracies in their reports. Um, in, in addition to the, the work we're doing through our um, exam teams, we've, um, we've uh, published or we've uh, made public the fact that we will be requiring the major consumer reporting companies to provide Regularly, uh, regularly provide what we're calling accuracy reports to the Bureau as part of this overall supervisory monitoring function. So what does that mean? Well, we're asking for some basic information 
um, about things like what are the furnishers with the most overall disputes? Um, we, we want to know that. We want to know the industries with the most disputes. Um, we want to know which uh, furnishers have particularly high dispute rates relative to their peers. So there's some basic data that we will be collecting as part of our supervisory function um, and um, looking at that and obviously the consumer reporting agencies need to look at that um, as well. Um, we've had a number of findings also in our supervisory work having to do with um, inadequacies, inadequacies in dispute processing and resolution. Um, we've made it a, high, a, a very high priority for just about every kind of exam, whether it's mortgage servicing or debt collection or student loan servicing, to look as part of those exams on the furnishing obligations of those entities and have found uh, many issues there. Um, I think it, it's safe to say as a general matter that has not been a compliance focus to date. And this is across bank and non-banks as well. Um, in, in some areas in general, this is speaking very generally, we found, perhaps no surprise, more compliance management system issues in non-banks than banks because the non-banks we supervise had not been supervised before. Um, but when it comes to furnishing, we've, we've found it in, in um, uh, both depository and non-depository institutions as not really something they focused on before. So again, we're looking at the whole system, trying to press on all parts of it and making sure everyone involved in the system uh, is doing their job. And then finally, we've also looked at compliance with adverse action notice requirements that Jessica mentioned, both the Fair Credit Reporting Act notice requirements as well as the Equal Credit Opportunity Act uh, requirements um, and especially uh, to the extent there's um, the adverse action reasons under the ESOA uh, driven by a scoring model that give consumers um, some information about what's driving the, the reason for the adverse action. So uh, that's supervision um, and then we've also had a number of enforcement actions that have had um, all or part um, have, have had to do with um, Fair Credit Reporting Act compliant. Uh, compliance. Um, for example, we had a case against um, an auto finance company called First, in, First Investors um, where we required them to pay a $2.75 million fine um, to fix errors and change its practices um, in its uh, credit reporting uh, system. It had used third-party software program to furnish um, data to the consumer reporting agencies, but we found that First Investors had furnished inaccurate information about its uh, customers to credit reporting agencies for at least three years. Um, and it had discovered the problem and had notified its vendor, but had not done uh, much more. Um, so the kinds of incorrect information um, that were reported is wrong payments and overdue amounts. Uh, there were inaccurately reported that many of its customers uh, date of first delinquency, which is key in terms of the obsolescence provisions of the FCRA, um, and there were also inflated number of delinquencies. Um, in one case, uh, first investors reported a, cons a consumer was delinquent 11 times when in fact the consumer had only been delinquent twice. Um, we had another case um, against a buy here, pay here car dealer um, uh, last November called Drive Time. Um, in that case, Drive Time, it was um, not just a Fair Credit Reporting Act, but also a, a collections, an unfair debt collection uh, practices case. Um, Drive Time um, uh, had to pay $8 million in civil money penalty um, to, uh, to, as a result of these practices. Um, and some of the issues in Drive Time had to do with um, inaccurate information about the timing of repossessions, the dates of first delinquency, um, and making it appear that consumers uh, cars were repossessed more than they uh, were repossessed more recently than they actually were. Um, I want to uh, just say a few words about our um, so some of the research we've done so far. Again, relatively new agency, but there have already been a number of reports that we've done um, relating to the consumer reporting system, to credit bureaus, and credit scores. Um, one of the first white papers in September 2012 that our, um, our research markets and regulations colleagues um, produced was a credit score um, what was on um, the whole credit reporting system and some of the issues um, uh, with um, the whole um, dispute uh, processing and accuracy in the system. Um, more recently, we've um, issued, um, actually just very recently, um, a report um, on called uh, about credit invisibles. Uh, this is a report I think we uh, put out just last week 
finding that 26 million Americans are credit invisible with no credit record, so I guess they, that's the opposite of big data, um, and 19 million were unscorable. Um, consumers in low-income neighborhoods were more likely to be credit invisible or unscored, um, and black and Hispanics consumers were more likely to be in those groups. Um, we issued a data point on medical debt, um, which in uh, May of 2014, um, and uh, that summarized how credit scoring models treat information in credit reports about consumer debts that are in collection. And that research found that some credit scoring models overly penalize consumers who have medical debts in collection as compared to consumers who have other debts in collection. And um, because of that, I believe, as well as other focus on the medical debt issues um, by, by others uh, looking at this, there have been some changes in that area. Um, we also looked, uh, produced a white paper on credit scores, compared the credit scores sold to creditors to those sold to consumers, and the study found that while scores sold to consumers were highly correlated with the scores um, used by lenders, uh, about one in five consumers would likely receive a score that could be materially different from what a lender would see, receive. Um, and our work in terms of trying to report out and um, shed some sunshine on some of the consumer reporting issues has been not just with traditional credit bureaus, but we also held a forum on checking account access and screening, um, where we looked and, and uh, led a discussion um, and gathered information about the bank's practices for screening checking account applicants um, and the issues uh, that were raised there. Um, so those are some of the, um, those are some of the, um, that, that's some of the work the CFPB has been doing, um, again, in our a couple years, um, but I think you can see that it's a very important topic and area for us. We're very concerned about these issues in terms of the collection uh, of data on consumers and use. Thank you, Peggy and Jessica, for that very impressive uh, presentation of the work that your agencies have been doing independently and, 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 and together. Frank, would you like to offer some comments on what you've heard and where you sure. think we have to go? Sure. Well, I really appreciate um, the presentations today. I think that they are terrific news on a number of levels and, and, and a terrific report on agencies that I think are not just leading um, the United States' response to big data, but also are sort of beacons internationally. And I, I think that this is particularly um, hearing about the, the litigation out of the FTC and the, the reporting and other supervisory authority of the CFPB, I think that's incredibly important for nations around the world to look to um, <coughs> as providing models. I will um, offer a few questions, and, you know, and, and um, I would love to hear responses to these to the extent that these seem like to be uh, plausible ideas and also clarifications or education of, the, of, wa of those watching about the enforcement models here and some of the ideas behind them. The first that I had is um, there was the 60 Minutes report on credit reporting, and uh, you know when some of the horror stories that 60 Minutes uh, evoked, um, one of the lawyers said, "Well, the reason why there are so many horror stories is because it is in the long run more profitable them to, to them to ignore us than it is to even if they get hit by one lawsuit at a time or one other um, sort of legal action." And one sort of thing I was wondering about is we've heard a lot of fines, and certainly for me, if I were hit by a $1 million fine, I would be wiped out. But, but I wonder for some of the firms, if we might be able to get reporting from the agency on fines as a percentage of either firm's assets or revenues. Because I think as a, as a matter of transparency, it would help us a great deal to understand the impact of the fine if we knew, you know, is that, say, half of the revenues for the year or 1% or, or, or less than 1% or, or how that sort of affected them. Um, I also think that in terms of, um, uh, as someone that, so, that you know, has, has read Dobbs on Rem or trying to read through Dobbs on Remedies and thinking about remedies from a law professor's perspective, what is the theory of remedy behind some of the fines imposed? Is it a theory that the fine imposed is to reflect the damages imposed by the company? Or is it a theory of deterrence, such that you know, we can guess that a company hit by a fine of a quarter of their revenues for that year is never going to do this bad thing again? 
Um, I particularly say this because of Alexis Goldstein's activism in terms of uh, raising public awareness of the more traditional financial regulators' fines uh, to recidivists, to financial recidivists, and Judge Jed Rakoff's uh, attention to the potential lack of a deterrent effect in those areas um, when uh, it's not exactly clear to the traditional regulators um, how, or it's not exactly clear to the public how much of the fine is as a percentage of assets or revenues. Another question that I had that sort of relates to a presentation I saw from the OFR a few years ago was that the Office of Financial Research, um, another entity uh, created under Dodd-Frank, you know, um, was trying to keep track of, via legal entity identifiers, lots of complex financial transactions. But they themselves said that it was so difficult to get standardized data reporting and to otherwise keep track of just what was going on, to sort of monitor. And when I was at the presentation, someone from a, a non-governmental non organization, uh, opencorporates.gov, said, hey, we've got a whole big team of people that are part of the sort of Wikipedian, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, citizen scientist community. And you know, the Sloan Foundation was supporting this group, other groups foundations were supporting them. Can we help out? And it seemed as though the OFR was a little hostile to that idea of sort of getting in the help of either NGOs or state-level entities or other entities. And I was just wondering, you know, given the FTC pioneering some cooperation with like the Better Business Bureau in the false advertising context, um, to what extent that might be part of agency agendas to sort of bring in as force multipliers either NGOs, whistleblowers, um, state-level organizations. I know that, for example, the Minnesota Attorney General, Lori Swanson, was, did an amazing job with Accretive in terms of trying to lay down a marker for limiting certain forms of big data usage in the healthcare context. And I mean, she was sort of out in front of the HHS folks in a way, but I think that she did an amazing job in terms of warning certain entities about, how the, about what might not be acceptable on a state level, even if it is acceptable, say, or was not explicitly prescribed on the national level. Um, and so I, I know that's, those are already some big questions. So yes, <laughs> right. thank but you. thank you, yeah. Peg, do you want to respond first, or Jessica? To which part of that? <laughs> Any part that you want. Um, or that's applicable. So I think one of the reasons I, I took some time uh, to talk about um, this uh, tool called supervision, which is different as applied to the consumer reporting agencies than, than enforcement, is because um, I, think, I think it's, um, it's the kind of oversight that is, is constant yeah. and is um, going to be uh, for some time to come, just like with the largest banks in the country um, present in cons the consumer reporting marketplace that has not uh, has not been there before, and so um, so before you know get to fines and deterrence, um, it's more like in the first instance make sure your house is in order and the injury is not uh, occurring uh, from the get go, and so um, that's not going to necessarily happen overnight. But, but that is the goal. That's why I talked about compliance management systems and why it really is incumbent upon um, all of our supervised entities. That's why we talk about it so much, how we expect them to have high level oversight, to have training in place, to have monitoring in place, for them to be really looking at their own practices. So to the extent there's a pattern or a case or something uh, that, that they're aware of, an audit, that that um, that uh, reveals information um, that shows they need to uh, address something in a systemic way. That's what we expect them to do, and we will also be looking, um, as we are with our uh, accuracy monitoring information that we've gotten about what we think um, needs to be looked at to basically drive um, better practices in the first instance. Um, so, um, it, remedies is a huge, huge issue that we're constantly debating. Um, the, um, obviously, it, um, when you're talking about a civil penalty, and we don't have civil penalty authority in a lot of our um, uh, uh, privacy, in the privacy area in particular. When you're talking about that, the, the, um, the remedy should be a deterrent remedy. That's what penalties are all about. A lot of what we do is, um, not uh, it is um, uh, not penalty oriented. It might be redress oriented, like in the fraud case. And the remedy there is to get money back for consumers. 
So, so uh, depending on whether you're talking about civil penalties, which is meant to be deterrent, or um, or disgorgement, getting you know not letting a company enrich itself, or getting money back for consumers, a diff there's different factors that drive that. For our penalty cases, which would be the Fair Credit Reporting Act and, and the Equal Credit, Credit Opportunity Act and the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, some you, you know of our sectoral statutes, um, there are statutory factors to consider, including the ability to pay, et cetera. So it's probably a fair question, how much did this, you know, how much did this really hurt? Um, um, and, um, um, but, um, but, for Section 5, we generally, except when you violate an order, lack penalty authority at all. So we're always looking for theories about how to get money back for consumers, which in privacy can be very difficult to quantify the injury. Um, it's very important to keep in mind that, uh, that monetary remedies are only one piece of it, uh, and that in many cases, the most important thing is to stop the conduct and prevent it from happening again and be able to monitor it, which is the injunctive relief we get. Uh, but certainly in fraud cases, we want money um, uh, for deterrence. Um, and um, uh, we're always trying to see you know, what, what remedies we can get in any particular case. Um, in terms of um, w working with other organizations, uh, we do that all the time. I mean, we get petitions from this guy all the time. Um, I have one for you right Oh, here. yeah, thank you. Um, and we take those really seriously. Um, uh, yeah, we have one just from two weeks ago. Yes. We're taking it very seriously. Um, uh, we, um, we get a lot of our tips from whistleblowers, actually. We just don't, we can't publicize that. We, um, we get tips from companies, competitors. Uh, that don't like what their um, uh, what other companies are doing. We work very closely with state AGs, uh, and yes, they often are sort of the laboratory of invention or whatever that expression is. And they certainly were that on uh, breach notification, uh, and um, we are talking to them all the time. So we very much welcome input from other organizations. People don't realize that you know if you call me up. Um, and have something interesting to say, uh, you probably get, a, I shouldn't say this, but you probably get a meeting you know, with me or with some of our staff because we're constantly looking for feedback to stay in touch with what's going on out there in the community uh, and, and have that kind of interaction. So, yes. So let, let me ask, I, I want to open up the questions, but I want to ask a question about between the enforcement and the supervision. I mean, you think about the black box, and here's, here's I think, an astounding statistic that in 2015, more than half of the digital advertising from the financial services sector will be what's called programmatic. That is, complex connections of data brokers feeding into a profile, evaluating an individual in milliseconds, seven milliseconds, making a decision based on a variety of scores to target that individual with an ad that may, may lead to a transaction. But the idea that already the majority of ad spend in digital, right, for financial services is data, real-time, cross-platform, data broker driven, says something. It says something that we know more about the business practices. We know the alliance with the data brokers. We know what the data brokers can do. We know, we know what information those data brokers used by the financial <laughs> services companies uh, provide. We know about the race and, and the financial location, the hyper location. We know about the technologies. We know about the data management platforms and what those data management platforms are for. And we know the business goals. So we know a lot about what comprises the, 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 the framework for the black box. I mean, aside from this perpetual sp spend and inf influence, what more can your agencies do to make all this public? let alone regulated, so people understand about the vast amounts of, of data being collected and used by the big players, the American Expresses and the Chases, and the, and the payday lenders, who are all part of the system, and no one knows about it. Well, so. Um, and can you fix it by tomorrow? Yeah, what I, what I talked <laughs> about are, you know, it, we're, we're not going to be able to shine a perfect light on this, and certainly uh, we, you may know, uh, but consumers don't understand it. and. Um, my um, experience is that the, 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 the best way to get companies to change what they're doing is if their customers vote with their feet. 
Uh, and we did see in the privacy area some petitions by Move On, I think against Facebook and everything. And those actually had some, they did, they had some effect because there was a worry about, did we help? Yeah. But, but, you know, um, consumers aren't really voting with their feet right now. And part of it is it's hard to understand. But in terms of what we can do, we can, we, we're having workshops, we're trying to create better transparency, we're doing reports. Um, sometimes you find our reports very basic, but even though, you know, even our data broker report, um, which was fairly fundamental, got a lot of attention because a lot of people didn't understand uh, that this was happening, and you have to explain it in, in fairly basic terms to people. Um, we can bring enforcement in our enforcement um, actions um, get a lot of attention and they do generate um, consumer uh, interest. Uh, and uh, and this, is, this is something you may f not be as happy to do as I am. We need to encourage self-regulation because so much is happening so fast. Government agencies can't do it themselves. Even if things aren't perfect, you have to call out and consumer groups should be calling out things that are better than they were. For example, there are competing um, not competing, there um, there are um, two different organizations in the behavioral advertising space, and one has better guidelines than the other. And uh, you know, I think it's important that uh, the consumer community notice that, even though you may think they're all bad. Um, if progress is made, I think we do need to call it out. And, and you know, thank you, Jessica. And just briefly, Peggy, so I do want to turn to the to the audience. What about the supervisory role? Because you have the power to peel in and make these practices more transparent and accountable to best practices. Is that on the agenda of the agency? or? So um, as a general matter, um, I think in response to your question, what more we can do, I think there's probably a lot more we can do. Um, but at least um, for CFPB, we're, we're focusing on, as I said, kind of it's almost like first principles. We're just getting going with um, uh, making sure there's compliance with the FCRA and the ECOA. Um, for the, the current uh, uh, large consumer reporting agencies. And from where I sit, there's a lot to do there. Um, so, so that's kind of our focus, at least in the supervision enforcement fair lending uh, compliance world where I sit and then my research colleagues are starting to look at different aspects of credit reporting, credit scores, um, and I think we'll continue, you know, we had the, the convening on uh, checking account access. Um, so those are the kinds of things I think you can, you know, there will be more of. And um, over time, you know, we'll see what we can uh, accomplish through um, supervision. And supervision, there is a backstop at CFB of enforcement. And so, um, so we have a process where so any supervisory matter, this is in any area, um, if we find significant violations, um, we have a process to decide whether it's going to uh, move into the public enforcement uh, realm. And so um, that is uh, part of the process for consumer reporting as well. So those are um, the kinds of things we are, we're focusing on right now. Thank you. And we, we have time for uh, you know, two questions to any of the panelists. Uh, get the mic and please identify yourself again. And thank you. Hi, I'm Scott Klinger with the Center for Effective Government. Is anyone um, thinking about licensing of data brokers uh, as a possibility and, and going in and doing audits like you, you would a bank or a mortgage broker or anybody like that? Either federally or state, I don't, I don't know what the right I mean, I, I think that that is a really interesting idea, particularly because of the growth of the online lead generation that um, you know, Alexis was talking about earlier, whereby you know you have a lot of uh, entities that are online that are gaining a lot of power in terms of shaping people's opportunities and shaping their reputation and the type of things that are presented to them. And if we live in a society where you know you have a very disadvantaged subgroups of people, often minorities, often you know geographically isolated or otherwise you know uh, disadvantaged, being systematically routed toward the worst deals, the worst colleges, the worst loans, higher prices, etc. That's something people really need to know about, but it's hard to envision them that being known about without there being some, I'm thinking what's the opposite of post facto, I mean be, before the fact, <laughs> and ex ante understanding of what they're doing. You know? So I do hope to see something like that at least appear on the state level or perhaps you know, elsewhere. Yeah. So one of the things that we called for in our data broker report was a um, central portal 
where data brokers would all, um, where you'd be able to go and get access, get, you know, information generally about data brokers and also to get access to the data that's collected about you and to make choices there in a centralized por portal. Industry said, can't possibly do that. There's thousands of data brokers, which of course, you know, was more reason to urge them to, yeah. to do this. <laughs> yes. um, but, you know, and, and, I, and I don't think Congress is passing that law right now that we asked them to pass, but we're still saying, we still think this is a good idea. We don't have the authority to impose licensing um, the, requirements. The, the more responsible folks would want the less responsible folks rein in. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, too, to think about that dynamic. I mean, I was, oh, sorry. I mean, I, I was, uh, but it is, it's strange also the role that just raw ideology can play. For example, if you look back to regulation of eggs during the Bush administration, there was huge pressure from the largest egg producers to rein in the worst egg producers because there were all these cases of salmonella, et cetera. But just out of sheer ideology, there were folks in the administration who did not want to see that done. And I think that's really troubling, but I think you're exactly right. And just to build also on Jessica's point about self-regulation, I'm part of a group called the Council on Big Data Ethics and Society, and we are constantly brainstorming ways in which we can get cultures in data science. You know, just as to become a lawyer, you have to have a certain level of professional responsibility and validate that. I think similarly to be a data scientist in any of the entities that we've covered today, one ought to have to adhere to some basic requirements of responsibility and of ethics. And to get that type of data ethics in the corporate sphere would be a really big step forward. There'd be a lot of people at Google, Facebook, and most of the corporations in the world who have to be given a lot of tranquilizers if that <laughs> comes true. Is there um, uh, another question? You want to introduce yourself? JC, a server privacy. What power do consumers have to stop the sale of their information by data brokers? Um, that's a really good question. That's one of the reasons we asked for a portal. But um, first, if there are, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of work for consumers. First, uh, some data brokers do have opt-outs. They're hard to find, um, but um, a, a persistent consumer can, can find the opt-out, and they could even request to be opted out, even if there isn't an opt-out provided. Um, there is also sometimes the ability to opt out of having your data shared at the sources, but that could be, um, you know, what I was talking about, that, you know, when you're doing business with a company, don't, and when they say we, we share your information and give you choices, and, and a number of companies do exercise that choice so that information isn't transferred further to data brokers or other third parties. But right now, um, the ability of consumers to control that is, is limited. I think Axiom actually is one of the data brokers that does have. Yeah, but it's very limited. But it's limited. Yeah, you have to give them more um, but, information. But, um, you know, consumers <laughs> should request things even if they're not offered in a way, you know, call the, the 800 number because if, if companies start hearing from people that they want certain things, uh, they may take note, and, and consumers should be vocal about these things, but it is very hard for individual consumers to try to take control. Right. And we, and for maybe for the, can opt out of the pre-screen list of the credit bureau, yeah. so that is one established right that I would agree with Jessica. Consumers should not hesitate to. And, yeah. and so the final, oh, go ahead, please, Peggy. The, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, the credit bureaus can scale, sell uh, pre-screened lists of consumers that meet certain criteria, as long as they're going to get a firm offer of credit. Um, so there are certain rules established when that can happen, but consumers have a right to opt out of being on those pre-screen lists. And you, you There's also have an opt-out that DMA provides, but I don't think that opts you out of the underlying data collection. It's just you're not going to get catalogs. Direct Marketing Association. Yeah. Let's have the final word. Frank, want to have the final word? You've been so kind to sit here oh. all this morning <laughs> and participate. Oh. And congratulations again on your powerful new book. Oh, well, thank you. And I just, my, my final word would be just, um, I want to applaud the work of um, advocates like Alexis and Sarah. I think they're doing amazing work. I hope that, you know, to the extent I can help um, bring their ideas and their good work to the attention of uh, very dedicated public servants um, like Peggy, like Jessica, I think that's, I feel very honored to play that role. And um, I just hope that we can together join to form communities online, to form communities um, in real space that are going to uh, really help understand and make this economy more fair. Because um, without that, I think we face a really troubling future. So I really want to thank 
want thank finally once again the, the folks from government today who've come to, to share all the great work that they're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Now, Ed? Uh, I, want, I want to thank Professor Pasquale and um, our panelists from the government, our panelists from the advocacy groups, and my colleague Jeff Chester. This is only a two and a half hour event, but it's one of a series of events that we will be holding. We'll be issuing more reports, and we will be trying to make these important matters more front burner matters for Washington, D.C., and the rest <laughs> of us. Thanks for coming.